let's have a class and uh, uh, our last uh, class for the lecture we will very quick finish the virus section and then we'll spend uh, uh, maybe half of the half an hour uh, 45 minutes to review the final exam okay okay here is something uh, some announcements you already received the email I just want to be re-emphasize this Thursday December 7th 11 o'clock right here so that will be our first early exam so first come first serve and uh, December 8th, that will be 12.30 to 3.30 in the afternoon, we'll be in the lab room. That will be our second early exam. Uh, also, first come, first serve. So during that pe uh, period of time, you just come in, we'll give the exam paper you do. Uh, you need a special accommodation, you need to send me an email separately for the final exam. Uh, I know majority of you will come December 14th. That's a university scheduled final exam will be 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock, right here, not 11 o'clock. I have a couple of times uh, students coming 11 o'clock, it's already gone. Okay, so 8 to 9 if you wanted to do December 14th. And if you need a special accommodation, I will be here December 12th, so if you want to you wanna, uh, do that, just send me an email. And uh, if you want to do early exam on Thursday, just come and see me in the office 10.30. You want to do 12.30 Friday, I think we have a separate room inside of the lab room, so you can use it too. Okay, so those are for the accommodation. Uh, grade lecture total is 400. Um, this is safe A, and this is A minus. Okay, so roughly 84% is A minus. And below that is B, I don't mind. Like C, you want to get a C plus, it doesn't matter. That's, so you can do, okay, and don't forget you also have a final exam bonus point essay writing here. This is 250 words to 350 words regarding sexual transmitted disease. Is that a social problem or a medical problem? It's a debate question. And you need to write this in the exam paper, okay? So, and we will grade it. That is 30 points. Make sure you do that, the essay point. Okay, same as you have like insurance for the uh, lab exam. A lab final exam, the grade I will be put into the e-campus this afternoon. You will see them. Okay, so that's some announcements before we do. So let's talk about this virus. Let's finish it. Uh, I always put a virus at the end because uh, last three years you already heard about the virus too often and I don't want to be put at the beginning because you may feel tired about it because of the coronavirus. You get lots of information from different places and they, you have a different education material so we just go over from a microbiology standpoint to talk about that. A virus obligate parasites need a host. This is very important concept. Remember, this guy comes, people say, this is a box, a mailing box. Okay, do you think coronavirus is going to be there? Yes, possible. If there is a bacteria there, is that right? If there is, a, if there is some kind of live cells there. But the chance is high or low very low because you need a host remember and there is a lot of pseudoscience they say that the mailing stuff shipping from amazon is cultivated with coronavirus that is ridiculous announcements because there's no host thing it's not a bacteria 
Bacteria E. coli will be in the mailing boxes. Virus will be there, maybe, but the chance is very low. Another thing, are those virus, are those gonna cause problem? Might not be very, might not be have a problem because there's no host to there. So this is the first thing you need to know. Is this is an overly gate parasite. I use quotation mark, which means they must need a host to survive. This is the major difference between a virus and a bacteria. So all these type of pseudo science, you should you should be as a good undergraduate student, you should have a knowledge there. Yes, they possibly, but are there virulence? Maybe not. And how they can survive there? Maybe it's a couple of minutes, one hour. Without the host, they cannot survive. That, that's what the concept it is. You look at the second sentence. Incapable of independent metabolism. 99.9% .9 of the virus cannot do metabolism by themselves. They rely on a host. It could be very small. Let's say polio, only 20 nanometer, could be very large, 400 nanometer. Uh, passing through membrane system, what this means? We have a membrane future system, 0.22 micrometer future. This future, bacteria cannot go through. So that's a filtration block system for bacteria. However, virus will go through very easily. So that's filterable. So use any of those filtration system will not prevent virus. Possess a single type of nuclear gases. Only DNA or RNA. Never both. So that means it is either a DNA or an RNA, but never both, okay? Classification of the virus. Now, obviously, type of the nuclear gases, it's a single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, RNA. Capsid morphology, based on the capsid morphology, we can differentiate that. We'll show you the picture real quick. Envelope. Whether they have a packaged envelope or not, we say it's naked or non-naked. Host range, what the host it is. Animal virus, plant virus. Uh, if it's bacteria, we call it a bacteriophage. Uh, structure of the virus. Virus structure, I talk about this in our first class. Very simple. The outside is protein. And we call it capsid. Inside, nucleic acids and DNA or RNA. That simple. What happened? Because it is so simple, therefore, there is not much very effective antivirus drugs. There is a little bit developed after since coronavirus. However, not very effective. Even if it's effective, it will be very uh, horrible cause lots of the side of damage to your body because they couldn't be attacking protein. An animal human being has protein. So we'll have a severe side effects. Now, some people are gonna say, can we attack nuclear gases? And I told you before, anything attacking DNA or RNA, is a useless stuff. The reason is they have lots of mutation will be generated. You remember bacteria have a different pathway, have a different alternative pathway to survive during the replication process. Because there's lots of mutation that are gonna be generated, they have to keep the fidelity issue lower. Same as the virus. Because the structure is so simple, that, that's why not many effective drugs. So what's the best thing to do is a vaccination. This is true. The best thing to prevent, I won't say cure, I will say prevent a virus disease is vaccination. And another thing what we could do is antibody. So I will give you another example. When during the 2020 or 20, uh, 2021, when the coronavirus happened at the beginning, 
There is no drugs, no vaccination. What do we do? There is some of the company like Elaine Lilly, they developed the antibody. Remember I talked in the lecture, we couldn't use the rabbits, is that right? We injected the rabbits with a pathogen. Let's say we injected it with coronavirus. Then we could get anti-coronavirus serum, which means the serum rich antibody. They use the antibody as a treatment. Targeted with antigen because every single coronavirus is a new antigen. They could be attacking each other, will cause precipitation, uh, anti-toxication, uh, opsonization, whatever you call it. So there's a full connection between that. However, generator antibody is very expensive. That's why this method does not be using very frequently. The reason is, remember we talk about generally the anti-staphylococcus aureus serine took lots of the times, and each one micrometer, a microliter is about $500. And this is, if it's one microliter of coronavirus antibody, it will be a couple of thousand, even $10,000. So that's a very expensive message to do. So that, but it's the best way to do. However, it's difficult to do. That's why later on people generate some of the uh, drugs, uh, but it's, I don't think it's very effective. They use it in a life-threatening situation, okay? So you can see this is capsid and the nuclear acids. Now, if you have a envelope, what happened? If the envelope, you have these spikes. And these spikes, if for coronavirus, like a crown. That's why we call it a coronavirus. But these spikes could be shifting. When they shift, they will generate lots of the mutations. Therefore, you have a delta, and you have a, a, a Omicron, or different type of the mutations comes out because of these spikes will be shifted. Now, where we get the vaccine, we get the protein, we get the S protein from, from the RNA. Is that right? We get, we get the S protein from that. So that's a new method for the vaccination. Okay, so that's the structure of the virus. Okay, you can see the type of the virus, the morphology. Uh, herpes virus, uh, rhabdovirus, the phage, T phage, minivirus, human, periomary virus, tobacco, mosaic virus, phage, and you see a different shape of that. So capsids, you can see, we already mentioned, it is basically is composed by protein. And we also call it a promo, uh, uh, sorry, protoma. <coughs> it's called a protoma. And uh, the capsids could be helical, iso, hydro, or complex, which means a mixed cell. Therefore, you could see the helicap, helical capsids. This is a tobacco mosaic virus. Okay, looks like a acron, and it looks like that. And the inside is RNA, and the lens of the virus is most likely is the size of the RNA, and the, which is packaged with a permal. And this is another one, which is a exohedral capsid. Uh, you can see a. a Isohedron is a regular polyhedron. This is a 20 equilateral faces and 12 verticals. So the capsimers, based on the different combination and morphology, we have a different name for that. So for example, the pentons, usually five subunits. Hexon is six subunits of the capsimers. And this is the one we mentioned before. It's a certainly is a bacteriophage. So bacteriophage, you have the capsid head, the nuclear gases. You have a collar, this, and you have a base, and you have those tails. So that's a bottom used to attach to the surface of a bacterial cell. And then the, the nuclear gases could be uh, invaded into there. Okay, so this is uh, using a, a light microscope. You can see a bacteria, uh, bacteria fudge, what it looks like. So the fudge, because they have a bottom, and also the capsid, the nuclear gases, so we call it a complex capsid. 
This is genome structure. We already mentioned only one type of the genome. So double-stranded DNA could be single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, and the chromosome is various. That could be four only or could be several hundred genes. So for example, they gave the example, influenza virus is about eight separated pieces of, our, of our RNA. Now, every single virus causes a disease. You need to know there is a time period that did not see any of the symptoms. We call it uh, eclipse phase. So what it means, the viral infection started. However, the infectious particles are not observed in the cell at the time. And then later, the infections will be reappear in the cell. So there's a time period of time which develops those infections. Uh, virus, most of the time, are very much host-specific. Uh, specific. So for example, if you have an E. coli fudge, let's say you have an E. coli fudge, then this fudge will be only attacking E. coli. If you have a salmonella fudge, it's going to be only attacking salmonella, and it's not going to be affected for listeria, because it's host-specific. Now, another thing I also want to mention, the fudge, most of the time, work very well at low temperature, because the low temperature, the bacteria is not growing. So relatively, it's stable for the bacteria, and the fudge could attack in there. And there are lots of the products already generated with anti-fudge um, like commercial products. For example, the Listeria have a couple of products already. Um, let's talk about that HIV virus. The HIV virus, there is a uh, CD4, it's just a protein. This CD4 usually will attack him. The, um, remember we talk about the dendritic cells, like this. This is called dend dendritic cell. And the dendritic cell, you have some couple of stuff there. This is called uh, a histocompatibility complex. And uh, therefore, these things will be recognized by the CD4 plus <coughs> of HIV virus because the histocompatibility complex usually is recognized to differentiate foreign and self cells. If the CD4 <laughs> attached to that, then the HIV virus will let the host not recognize them as a foreigner. So that's what the HIV virus can get into the body. Um, some of viruses infect many different species. So skunks, the dogs, we call it the rabies, humans and the bats. Um, the rabies could be coming from a different mammals, not only dogs, even cats could have a rabies. So that's why if you have a cat or dogs at home, it's required to do a scheduled vaccination of the rabies. Usually annually you have to do that, even like an indoor, indoor cat. Okay, and the, there, is a, there is a dream which is said by 2030, we could be concave the rabies, but uh, I don't see any of the news recently related to that. And so far, if you get a bites of the dogs, then you have to really do the rabies vaccination immediately, because otherwise you could be dying in 10, 10, 10 or 15 days. Is that right? The last symptom you see is people become crazy and scared to the, to, to, to the water. So just be careful about the rabies. Uh, viral multiplication. Um, this is usually the question in the exam. I want you to know the steps. So what are the steps of very similar universal among different viruses is attachment to the host cell. Then you entry, you go inside. The uncoating of the genome, so the genome will be released. They use the host cell machinery to do the biosynthesis, and assembly, and finally will be released, become a new virus, which is the daughter virus, and then go to another host cell, attacking another host cell. Um, viral particles, there is attachment sites. 
for non-enveloped the virus, usually it's a capsid because it's a protein. Enveloped the virus is proteins in the membrane system. Um, attachment sites recognize receptor sites on the target cells. The receptor sites, like I said, it's not a whole bacterial cell. It could be the partial structure of the bacterial cell, like a membrane proteins, polysaccharides, and the lipids. Um, this is how they're going to be happen. And the, this is a penetration uncoating. This is very similar to what we talk about, the mechanism of um, uh, cholobacterial dipseria. Remember, we talk about that. The AB toxin, when they come in, they generate an endosome, which is a receptor-mediated endosome. That endosome usually is a low pH. So they create an endosome, which releases the viral partial inside of the cell. Then following the penetration, the viral particle is broke down, and the nuclear gas is released. So there is a several scenario. The first scenario, the spikes is there, the host cell, and then you attach to it, and then you package it, and then the whole capsids with a, a genome, then you release inside of the cell. And the second scenario, what happened is generate an endosome. This is uh, most of the time, for most of the pathogen will be generated, especially those pathogens. Uh, originally, we have a theory, think about the pathogenic genome is coming from a bacteriophage. So this is what happened, a spikes fused with the cell membrane system, cell wall system. And they go inside, they generate the endosome, that endosome is a low pH environment, and then you release the whole genome with the capsids released into the host cell. But what's the difference between here is the sum of the non enveloped virus, although it's still doing the endocytosis, but the difference is that the capsids is released. The capsids is stayed, and only the genome sequencing is, re is released inside of the host cell. And then they use the host cell to regenerate the capsids. Okay, so there are the three different situations. The first situation, the whole virus directly go into the cell, the host cell. The second one, they generate an endosome, and the lower pH endosome release them. The last one, the capsid is not going inside, it's only the DNA or RNA will be coming inside. Um, this one is synthesis of viral components. So obviously we said it's a host uh, obligate parasites, so they use cell enzymes and the monomers. The viral nuclear acid is replicated, transcribed, and translated. This is pretty much the same. Now, because there is a different structure sometimes, so when they do the translation, they have some portions are early translated. So we say it's an early protein. And there is some of the structures, which is like a, prom a protomer, uh, like the um, capsid, the structure protein, they will be developed relatively later, so we call it a late proteins. And this is a, a zambrin. You can see what it looks like. The head protein, pearl head generate, mature head with DNA. So you have a neck. And this is the first part, which is important. The capsids with the nuclear gas is developed. Then you see a base, a base plate protein. The tubes, the seeds will be go there. And the finally is a tail fiber, which is like a collar, comes out. So, if you have a, use a people's example, the head here is just developed first. So you go here, is a body part, okay? Finally, this like the, the arms will be developed later and the color will be the last. So that's called the early protein and the later on we call it the later protein. So think about yourself, face a mirror, you could understand very well how this assembly comes out. Uh, viral release. Viral release, uh, you can read all these sentences, but I have two things I want to mention. First of all, hemoglutinin. What happened to hemoglutinin? In the human being, it will cause bleeding. That's the reason. Because these viral matrix protein with the cell membrane systems, they're attacking with each other and cause the blood. Now, how they release? 
It's very similar for in the lab section, we talk about the yeast cell, generator daughter cell, which is a blood-based body. So the viral release is very similar to the yeast, not to the bacteria, which is a budding viral. The budding generator, uh, the binding process, budding process, and then the free infectious viral with envelope will be generated. Okay, so that's a viral release. The two key words here is uh, hemoglutinin, cause bleeding, and the budding viral, which is released into the host cell. Okay, the next one, which is the bacteriophage. So bacteriophage, I just want to let you know, there is a two different type of the situation. The first type of situation, we call it a lytic fudge, which means a fudge attacking a bacteria, and the bacteria will be kind of lytic. It will be break down, and then will be died. That will happen for some of the fudges. But the majority of the fudge actually doesn't do that. What happens is they are attacking a bacteria cell. Instead of the lytic bacteria, they will put their own genome into the host chromosome. Therefore, they gave you a terminology called a lysogeny. And we have a couple of slides later on. We'll tell you this is a theory for most of the pathogen generated by the bacteria fudge for a bacteria. Um, there is some of the terminologies you could see here is a lysogen. Bacteria cell have the phage DNA integrated into the host chromosome. So for example, a lambda, a, a, a temporary phage, a phage capable to the lysogeny. And a good example will be the lambda phage. Lambda phage is very uh, nice, is a temperate phage. Um, remember, we talk about the DNA replication. I mentioned there is a method, which is a uh, Hershey Chase research, use a bacteriophage to uh, verify that the transformation material is DNA. And at that time, what they are using is kind of a temperate phage. They are lucky they have a temperate phage, they do not have a uh, they do not have a lytic fudge. If they have a lytic fudge, then the, then the whole cell will be bursted. Okay, you won't see anything about that. So the lambda fudge is a temperate fudge. Um, then we have other terminologies, the prophage. The fudge DNA has been created into the host of bacterial DNA. Then the temperate fudge could choose between lytic and the lysogeny. And the lots of the laboratory strains are lysogenies because we want those certain gene targeted the gene sequence by those virus, they could be inter integrated into the bacteria host, and then the bacteria could have a different function after translation. Uh, so here is something that we want to mention is that temperate phage does not mean it will always cause lysogeny results. They also could have a lytic process. It depends the growth situation. So this is a picture showing that. So let's say the bacteriophages go there. Okay, they are released. This is also the capsid, cis, and the colon. Then the released genome is into a host cell. And this is a chromosome of a host cell, most likely the bacteria. And they couldn't go to the lytic cycle. What's the lytic cycle going to happen? Those phage will using a bacterial cell machinery generate their own, phage, own, own, own machinery. And then they license and they release new phage. And these new phage will go ahead to find a new bacteria cell and repeatedly do the same thing. But at the same time, they also could have a lysogeny story, which is instead of you cause a burst, cause a lytic of a bacteria cell, the genome here, the red one, is integrated into the blue one. And then sometimes you expose to stress like a UV light, they will be like a knife to split them into the two half sections. And then they will generate, which is a prophage, and the phage will later develop and become a bacterial cell integrated with a phage genome. And later on, this phage genome very possibly is a toxin. This is, comes out with a very important theory here. We call it a lysogenic conversion.
And this knowledge we will test you in the final exam because I think it is important. So we listed lots of bacteria there. We talk about the Cornobacteria diphtheria, Staphylococcus aureus, Clostridium botulinum, Shigate toxin generally E. coli vibrotoxin. toxin. This is what happened is we see, <coughs> let's say this is a bacterial cell. Okay, the bacterial cell, they have a certain certain genome. Um, I sure still have the color paint here. They have a certain genome here. Okay, this is the bacterial genome. Looks like this. And I have a phage goes there. Okay, now this is going to release it. What they do? They are integrated here. And this piece, later on, become a toxin. That's why the bacteria will have a past pathogen, have a bad pathogenic effect because of these toxins. And these toxins coming from the phage. Let's say a beta phage. We already did the research showing this is for corner bacterial diphtheria. And the later on, people have a theory. People think about Shigay toxin, TSST. All these is all coming from a fudge. Now, what kind of the fudge? We don't know yet, but this is a theory talk about that. So, lysogenic conversion is a theory talk about why bacteria will cause the toxin. Because those toxins, long time ago, coming from a virus. A virus is a fudge. And then they integrated the toxin genome into a bacterial cell. And obviously, this is a temperate fudge. OK, and not a lytic fudge. Because a lytic fudge, they will be really cause a burst in the lytic of the bacterial cell. So, this is something that's very interesting. We had a project before to want to isolate a fudge from a soil <coughs> sample to see whether they can cure salmonella. But it is not very easy to do. Why? Because lots of the time, when we get isolation of a bacterial fudge, is a temperate fudge, is not a lytic fudge. Um, so instead of you curing a bacteria, you're actually working with the bacteria very well. And at this moment, you will see this is a host. And this is like a parasite. So this figure is well explained to you what happened. So I just want to let you know, isolation of bacterial fudge from soil sample is not difficult. But if you want to find a lytic fudge targeted for bacteria, that is difficult. Because most of them in the environments, it is actually a temperate fudge. That's what happened during their evolution. Okay. Okay. Next question: Lots of people will make a mistake. Can bacteria or can virus grow on the agar plates? No, they cannot do that. Virus need a host. So what they can do? Obviously, they can grow on plants. On animals, in chicken eggs. But if you want to grow really on a, a plate, what we need to do? You need to put a layer of bacteria first. Okay, that's a key. So this is something I will really want to emphasize to you. We don't have a condition to do. Uh, before we have a testing for the bacteriophage titer, but we can't do it right now because I don't have bacteriophage anymore. When we grow that, you can't just put a solution, have virus spread onto the agar plates, want to show the colony. No, it's not going to happen. So what we do? At the beginning, you using agar plates is fine. You need to spread with a bacterial layer. OK, then you add a liquid of the fudge. That's OK. Now what will happen? You will see all those transparent zone generators. This is called a plate. 
because at those certain points, the virus cause a lytic of the bacteria cell generates those transparent zones. This is not a colony, this is called a plague. So instead of we have CFU, we have PFE, plague forming units. Now we still could count the, the number of these plague forming units, but the range will be relatively small is 20 to 200. Okay, not 30 to 300. So just want to let you, let, let you know. Every time when you see a virus on the agar plates, which means it is a bacteriophage, you first have a bacterial layer there. Virus cannot automatically grow in there. So this is what happened, the plague, uh, how are we gonna measure? Okay, the infectious units, plague assay. So we're gonna put the uh, host cell bacteria layer. Then we add a fudge there. We count the number of the plagues, and we will say it's a plague forming units. The dilution is the same thing. The second thing what we do is called LD50. This is the dose to cause half of the samples died. But here I want to mention to you, this is not exactly half of the animals died. This is a statistical results. So the number could be, let's say you have 100 rabbits. It could be 47, could be 55, could be 48. You needed to do uh, different sets, at least six to 10 repeats and go to the software and then you automatically get the curve and then will, you will know the dose will cause about 50% of the host cells will be dead. So that's called LD50. This is a usually very important parameter to evaluate the drug dose efficacy. Okay, they're called LD50. Varroids. Uh, Varroids is not a virus. It is an infectious agent composed by circulated single-stranded RNA. So varroids is the RNA. It will cause plant disease. And I mentioned before, in 1996, in Fairbank, those palm trees has been affected with the varroids and caused huge damage for that. Okay, that's the varroids. Last slides right here, prions. Prions, this is a protein. This is not a virus, not a bacteria, not a parasite, it's a protein. It's a very special protein. And this protein will cause scrapie in the sheep. That's the first time people recognize it. However, it become famous because of the medical di disease. We all call it a PSC, bovine Spanish form in self philosophy. That first find is in 1996 in Great Britain. And the medical disease, there is a no way to treat. The only thing is you kill all the cows and they be buried. And uh, it could be transferred to the human beings, uh, cause all kinds of brain, di brain disease, neurological symptoms, and finally could cause death very quickly. And uh, because of that, uh, United States, um, uh, the story is that in 1996, started in Great Britain. In 2003, there is the first case happened, a medical disease happened in the United States. So that caused a big damage for the exportation of the beef products. So uh, even today, you go China, um, Australia, and Russia, they're still forbidden for the imports of the beef products for, from the United States because of their medical disease. That restriction has not been lifted yet. So it's very simple. If I wanted to ship a bag of beef jerky to my friends in China, it will be stopped at the border patrol or some, some, some area. It won't even go inside. Okay, so they will give you a sheet. They will say because of the 2003 the medical disease outbreaks, and so that's restricted for that. Um, in the human beings, it could happen is a CJD or also the Kuro. Uh, what happened for this one is really the muscle releasing. So what means re muscle releasing? That means you keep laughing about two hours. 
the people cannot control, and when you're laughing, your muscle is, is, is relaxing. Is that right? So you think about yourself, if you keep like ha 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 laughing about three hours, what's going to happen? So that's cause the, the symptoms for the colo and the CJD. Okay? So a very brief, we mentioned about the virus. I think the key point here is that uh, lysogenic conversion, this concept is important. And uh, I do want you to know the process of the steps of the viral multiplication, how they go into the host cell. And those things are important. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the review of the final exam. Uh, uh, first thing first, I would say that no matter how good you are, no matter how uh, lower you grade, um, please do not give up because there is a still at least 140 points is up in the air for grab. There's still lots of things you can do, okay? If you only need a 50 points to get A, please still study it normally. Uh, don't count your grades and only study 50 points because that will make it very dangerous. So that's my suggestion will be at least all these final practice questions you should do very well. And the key I will post it on the, on the e-campus this uh, evening sometimes. Okay. I would love to mention the first question will be in the exam to test you. Is acquired immune system development. Where is the answer? Do you receive a sheet, a sheet after you taking lab final exam? That will be the answer. Okay, so study that sheet. Basically, there's two lines, a T cell line, B cell line. Then if it's a large antibody, it's a small soluble antibody, we'll go different lines. We're gonna describe a little bit about that. That sheet, it's not a color sheet, it's a black white sheet, which is for this question. That will be in the exam because I want to let you know it, okay? The second thing I also want to mention is agglutination, opsonization, precipitation, those four different reactions between antibody and antigen, I really want you to not understand it very well because it is important. So, by all means says, this slide is important. Describes precipitation, neutralization, complement fixing, agglutination, and opsonization. That is important, especially opsonization. If you need extra points, make sure you know the structure of the antibody. It's not difficult. There is a H chain, light chain, uh, sulfide uh, bands and the hinge between that, then variable region and the constant region. Variable region for attaching antigen and the constant region for macrophage. This is also important. Okay, don't forget a very important question for you. What is this one? Names. What's O? What is H? Flagella? What is all? LPS side chain? Ceramic. And the 157H7 is a serological typing. Okay, that's important because you see this gone by all the times, you will see it. A salmonella is also important. Remember that a salmonella cantaloupe outbreaks if you look at the news. They say it's gonna be have another big wave for the food safety area. Cause we just had this terrible monster targeted to in Jason Farms in 2012. 12 years later, we have another big wave. Okay, so that's important. Okay, what will be the major part of uh, exam? Is all the acronym. Okay. What it has happened? Hazard analysis
political control points. You need to write the full name. What's the seven principles? Conduct a hazard analysis. Okay, or just write a, a check. Establish critical control points. Establish a critical limits. Establish monitoring procedure. Establish corrective actions. Conduct verification and the validation procedure. This is the third part you have to do. Make sure the CCP is working under control. Last one, <coughs> record keeping and uh, documentation. Okay, that's very important for you to know about that. Other things. What is USDA FSIS? United States Department of Agriculture What is FSIS? Food Safety Inspection Service What are rules for them to do? For meat poultry products and what? Processed egg. What is FDA? This is, you know, Food and Drug Administration. Now what they're responsible for other things, okay?